My beginnings with the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute start with the Children's Cancer Research Foundation and the Jimmy Fund. Uh, the Jimmy Fund was a heroic word in my household because my mother's brother was one of the founding trustees of that organization. He was a movie uh, exhibitor with a theater theaters all over the uh, Boston area, if you will, in the suburbs. Uh, he and his partner, uh, that was, by the way, L Lou Gordon, uh, his partner was Arthur Lockwood, and uh, Arthur's son, uh, Roger, is still a trustee of this institution. So there's, uh, and, they, and they had a, a lot of colleagues in the movie business whom they brought in. Among them was Dick Smith's father. So I knew all those people as a kid in the 40s. I mean, I, I was then you know, 12, 14 years old, something like that, and so I, I, I knew about them. And of course I knew about the Boston Braves and then the Boston Red Sox. I mean, I, I spent, I don't know how many hours in Braves Field and uh, uh, in Fenway Park. Uh, and you couldn't go to the movies without having the show interrupted and they would pass the can for the Jimmy Fund. That's how they raised the money originally. So yes, it's part of my whole childhood here. It's absolutely true that I had no interest in going into medicine when I went to Harvard College in 1947. Instead, I, I wanted to be an English professor and walk around uh, in the uniform that I already had, which was a plaid jacket with leather on the elbows and a green book bag uh, and a pipe, uh, which I could barely smoke because it choked me, but I still smoked a pipe, uh, in order to look like an English professor. There was a small problem uh, that I ran into <laughs> after about a year of that, and that was a lack of talent. And I began to think maybe my father, who had been begging me to go into medicine, because he had wanted to go into medicine. Uh, his father had strictly forbidden it because my grandfather thought doctors are bums and loafers who come to your house and drink your coffee and don't do a damn thing for you. So he wouldn't allow my father to go to medical school. You have to be an honest businessman. My father sent me to medical school instead and I changed my mind after seeing that I wasn't going to be an English professor anyway. My career was a peculiar one because I was determined to go to medical school to become a physician uh, running a, a multi-specialty clinic in a poor area of Cambridge. I'd been a social worker when I was at Harvard. Uh, and my mother was a professional social worker. So I had a lot of sort of background in that and the management of the, of the poor. And I re realized that there was no medical care appropriate for, for poor people. There, there was no system. So I wanted to build a system, sort of like the Harvard Community Health Plan. That, that was, and that's why they admitted me to medical school because I think they thought I was sort of unique. Uh, but halfway through, in the second year, I had an experience with a patient at the Boston City Hospital with alcoholic cirrhosis and a coma. And I couldn't understand the coma and went to one resident after another and they couldn't understand it either. And something sort of went off in my head I've got to find out about that coma. I've got to find out why it happened. And suddenly, everything changed in my life. I wanted to go to a place where I could learn scientific medicine. And that's why I went to the Brigham as an intern, because it was a very scientifically oriented place, 
to, I thought I'd certainly be an adult doctor. I hadn't thought about pediatrics, but I knew I wanted to do scientific medicine. And that's how I got to NIH, because they were looking for just that as they opened NIH's clinical center. They, they captured residents from all over the country who didn't want to go to Korea. And I had, by that time, married with two children. I didn't want to go to Korea either. I just wanted to do scientific medicine. Came back to the Brigham, and then I began to realize something. The real interest in scientific medicine is in children, not in adults. I, aging just didn't interest me that much. And now that I'm very aged, I can see why. I felt that in pediatric hematology, I would be able to get much closer to what was being now discovered in England, and that is the structure and function of DNA. And that would somehow uh, create for me an opportunity that, that wouldn't be available to me if I stayed in adult medicine probably totally incorrect, but that was the way I saw it. And when I got a chance to go to Children's Hospital, I jumped at it. And that was 1964. You have to keep in mind that in my household, the name Sidney Farber was almost a religious experience. I mean, one of the reasons why was that a lot of the members of the Variety Club had also been in the Army and had come back from the war and, and found that their companies, their movie co uh, exhibitor companies, had made a fortune. Because everybody who wanted to watch the war could only do it at the movies. There wasn't any television. So people saw the war by going to the movies. And everybody went to the movies. And they had to go to their neighborhood movie because there was no gas. You couldn't go anywhere except to a neighborhood movie. And that, that made these men very wealthy. And I knew my uncle very well and, and uh, Roger's father. And I could hear them talking about it. We've got to get rid of the money. We've got to give it away because it really isn't clean money. And, and uh, these boys are all coming off ships, all wounded and hurt and we're much wealthier. It's not fair. So they began to look all over Boston for a charity. They knew it should be given back to the community. And that's how they found Sidney, in a, in a little hole in the children's, he was chief of pathology at the children's hospital. And absolutely focused on the cancer problem. He once told me, I never want to do another autopsy on childhood leukemia. It's too terrible. And uh, he de just devoted himself to it. And in, in back then in the 40s, he allied himself with an extremely interesting man who doesn't get enough credit, Yella Pragada Suba Rao. He had been an associate professor in the Department of Biochemistry working for a man I don't think I would have liked, Cyrus Fisk. And he was a brilliant chemical biologist of his era. He knew how to make molecules, which, you know, is extraordinary. And he, he, he never got the credit for that at Harvard. In fact, he left and went to Letterly. And somehow, Sidney, who so impressed my uncle and all of his partners as one of the most brilliant men they ever let, met. They just came home. I can still hear them talking about him. We have met the most brilliant man in Boston, and we're going to fund him. And, the, and what he had done was get a hold of Subarau and get Subarau to make molecules that looked like folic acid. And the reason, there was a lot of reasoning for that, that, that I don't want to get into the details of. But there was good, good scientific reason to look at folic acid and, and inhibit it in leukemia. 
Subarau did it. He made the drug. And, and Diamond in, and Farber in, in 1940, I think they did the, published this in 1946. They did the start of the studies in 44, something like that, uh, uh, showed that they could put kids into remission with this single agent drug. So he was a hero. He got every prize you can think of for that. It was really terribly important. And you should have seen my uncle and his, and his partners talking about it. I mean, they, he made them feel great. And Children's Hospital got all excited, gave Sidney Farber the land on which to build the, the first Jimmy Fund building. Because Sidney Farber knew that the problem for children and adults was the fact that cancer is a chronic disease and you have to have an outpatient department that can cope with it. It's an outpatient illness. Yes, you go to bed with cancer frequently, you need surgery, this, that, and the other, but your care is really outpatient-based. And most of the high-tech general hospitals don't know how to do that. They, what they know how to do is take care of sick kids and, and, and adults in beds and do things. But the actual day-to-day -day management of a child has got to be outpatient and send them home for, for the night. That's what Sidney's genius was. He, he had nurses and doctors, but he also had teachers, social workers, support staff of all kinds, all bought by these guys running around with their cans in, in the movie theaters. It, it was something very exciting to, to grow up with. So I thought, too, that he was a total genius. However, what I didn't understand was that he also had very fixed ideas about how things ought to work. I mean, he, he had, you have to understand the man. Nobody believed him. Nobody believed that cancer could be controlled with a little molecule. It had to be cut out or radiated or so. Nobody could understand that at all. And he was, the doctors at the children's hospital didn't want to admit the patients. Their answer was, let them die. At least they'll die quickly. And the sadness in the family will, will, will be limited. This man is going to poison them with these drugs, make them sick, make them live longer. The whole thing will be worse. We don't want anything to do with it. Fortunately, Charles A. Janeway, the chief of pediatrics at the time, didn't agree with that and said, Sidney, you take over. All the cancer patients will go to you, into your clinic, the Jimmy Fund Clinic. The only thing is you really should hospitalize them here. And Sidney was the first to want to do that. He didn't want to have any beds. It's too dangerous, he said. Hospitals know how to run beds. I know how to run a clinic. And that's how it all began, with the children going to the children's hospital when they needed it, in the beds, and Janeway gave him his own floor to do that. And uh, that was the setup when I came on the scene. Sidney Farber was an unusual man, but he was also a predictable man from his own background. He had been part of an enormous family in Buffalo. By the way, all of the children were successful, some of them really very successful. Uh, he went to medical school and uh, became a pathologist. But the most important thing that happened to him was to go to Germany. Because it was in Germany where, where, where scientific medicine really began. Uh, let's, that's not quite fair, because France had been very strong. And, uh, but the French system had become more sclerotic. And the German system was doing extremely well. Uh, 
in the 30s and 20s, when uh, I should say the 20s, uh, when uh, uh, Sidney was there. And he learned a great deal, but what, what he also learned <laughs> was who's in charge. He, lear he learned the Geheimrat philosophy of, of, of Germany, and he wasn't, he, 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 was, he was not shy in saying to people, I'm in charge, you are not, and we're going to do it this way. He was devoutly cons worried about damaging children with drugs. And although he recognized that if you use a single agent in leukemia, there will rapidly become resistance, and in fact, all of the children in that famous paper in the New England Journal relapsed from resistance. He knew that, but he always believed there'll be another drug. We'll follow the drug that failed with another one that will work and we'll keep cycling them that way. And I'm not going to combine two drugs because I don't know how to do it. And if I do it incorrectly, I'll hurt a child. And I'm not going to make things worse. If I can't make them better, at least I won't make them worse. Now, I had been at the National Cancer Institute for a couple of years, and I'd kept very close track of the field. When I was there in the, in the 50s, it was totally unsuccessful to use two or three drugs. It was awful. We didn't know how to do it. We didn't know the doses. We didn't know the frequencies. It was a mess. The children got sick, and they died. It was just what Sidney Farber said. That's what I saw. When I came back to Children's, finally, things had gotten better over the years. And in fact, there were 30% survivors. There weren't any under Sydney. Now, nobody got poisoned either. I mean, the, the, and the patients were still very devoted to him. But my position was, you may have to take a risk in order to get the benefit. And I went to see him to tell him that. We must use combination chemotherapy. And he looked at me and said, fortunately, Dr. Nathan, Dr. Nathan, you are not in charge. I'm in charge. And there won't be any combination chemotherapy, not while I'm in charge. So I said to him, well, Dr. Farber, if you really hold to that, I'm going to have to send no more patients to you from our program. I'll just send them to the Mass General, where I know the people, and they'll do combination chemotherapy for me. And he, he stared at me. And actually, the, his whole color changed. Uh, and he opened his desk drawer, and he brought out a kitchen match. And he snapped it. And then he threw it in front of me and said, I'm going to break you like that. <laughs> I said, Dr. Farmer, I'm sorry, but that's the way I feel about it, and, and it really, that's what I'm going to do. And I left. And <laughs> that night, of course, my phone rang, and it was my mother, and she said, David, dear, whenever she called me David, dear, I knew that there was some big issue. <laughs> she said, Lou just called me. Arthur called Lou. You've insulted Dr. Farber. You cannot do that. And I said, Mother, you don't understand the problem. She said, I absolutely understand the problem because you're the problem. Do not be rude to Dr. Farber. He is a great man. And I said, Mother, I'm in charge of these patients. What about me? You're a nice boy. I'm saying that he is a great man. Do not insult Dr. Farber. I gave up. My wife then, who heard all this, came and said, you're bothering mother, don't bother mother. <laughs> so I had zero support, except from Janeway. I think Dr. Farber knew more than anyone about the importance of combination chemotherapy. 
uh, he, his problem was he couldn't bring himself to injure a child. That's really what the problem was. Tom Fry was a superb uh, uh, chemotherapist, and he knew before he started that he would have to injure people if he was going to get anywhere, because it was dose finding. We didn't know in humans what the dose was. We sort of knew but from animal studies, but it, every child was a little bit different, and the, it was really very difficult. He was a superb chemotherapist. I learned a lot from Tom Fry. And when he came, uh, Sidney only lived about a year after he came, uh, Sidney had brought in Tom Fry. He knew that it had to be combination chemotherapy, but he just couldn't do it himself. He couldn't have on his conscience that a child died on his watch from his actions. From leukemia, I'll take it, but not from what I do. I mean, that's, he, he, it's very hard to say in these arguments who's right, who's wrong. I think he was wrong. Look at us now. But there was a lot of trouble getting there, sadness. So Tom started us on a different path, and I was glad to go to work for him. I enjoyed Tom Fry because he had a sunny disposition. You'd go in there, he was relaxed, he, he, he didn't try to browbeat people. He, he was just a good guy with a lot of creativity and a lot of, of, about combination chemotherapy and how to put these drugs together. And I thought he would be a great supervisor of anything I wanted to do over at Dana-Farber with the fellows who were on the scene. And one of them was a tall guy off of a submarine, <laughs> uh, S Steve Salen, who arrived uh, saying he no longer wanted to be a psychiatrist. He wanted to be a cancer chemotherapist. So I said, fine, uh, you come into the program, you can become a fellow with us, and we'll have Tom Fry supervise both of us, and we'll get this done. And we had excellent, uh, he also, Tom, brought in wonderful biostatistics, which was very important for, for clinical trial management. And he brought in excellent scientists, basic scientists, as Sidney had done. Sidney was enormously good about getting great basic science. Uh, but so was Tom. He got very good people. And I was glad to open up a whole new division of pediatric oncology and get going. The modern history of, of Dana-Farber uh, is really a fascinating one because it's all built around the, the, the personalities of the, of the leadership because it's a small enough place so that the, the leaders have a big influence. Uh, uh, Tom transformed the place clinically. I mean, you have no idea of how well he did that. I mean, he, he got the adult program really working extremely well, and he supported the pediatric program, got me to, to work with Steve, and we really did extremely well that way. But there was also a lot of very good basic science coming in. And uh, this became a, a sort of a, a crisis in space. There wasn't enough room for these clinics. There wasn't enough room for the labs. And so there was a lot of ferment and anger and fighting. And uh, Tom Fry was not great on fighting. He didn't believe in fighting himself. He didn't like fighting. And he wasn't strict enough with people. And so there was a lot of behavioral problems that started to spring up among highly intelligent people. And there was even a fist fight in the parking lot, I mean, it, 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 among staff members. I mean, it wasn't good. So the trustees decided that we've got to get a stronger leader in here to keep, we would, don't want to lose anything, but we don't, we, we want to keep the, the tension down. And nobody 
is more frightening than Baruch ben Asraf. I don't know why. He, he was a very small man, and um, he, he, he was extraordinarily intelligent. And maybe it was his intelligence that was sort of appalling and worrisome. And he had a philosophy, mind your own business. Do your thing. Don't, don't mess with your neighbor unless your neighbor wants you to mess with him. And those were his rules. And the place quieted down. You couldn't hear a pin drop. Uh, uh, it was really amazing. And of course, the Nobel Prize didn't hurt. And I, I liked working for him because I knew his, his office had not a paper on the table. You know, nothing was out of place. He, he uh, answered my questions in minutes. I don't think I ever had an interview with him that lasted more than eight minutes because he immediately came to decisions. And uh, so for me, it was sort of a joy working with him. But it was time for him to retire. And that's where a, a serious mistake was made. Because the finest man in the entire Harvard faculty was Chris Walsh. There was nobody better. All the hospitals loved having him on their scientific review boards and things. Because he, one, he was a great scientist, and two, he was a great human being. And we weren't worried about the, the patient care problem, that he was a, not a physician, uh, because uh, we knew he would appoint good people and, the, and, the, and that would handle itself very well. I was all for that. What I didn't realize was that we were beginning to grow very quickly. And Chris really had no background in safety or the, the, the mechanisms that you have to have to keep a place really safe. The, uh, and furthermore, Benassaraf and Fry both wanted beds internally. I begged them not to do that because the main safety problems are really in the beds, particularly where chemotherapy is being given in higher and higher doses, but all sorts of problems occur in these beds. And, and I, my belief is that beds ought to be in a big hospital with all the bells and whistles. But they went ahead and did it anyway, and Chris inherited that. And he didn't have the sort of instincts that he had to have to, to, to say, stop the music. How could he do that? He wasn't a physician. He didn't feel he, he was, he's such a decent man. He wasn't going to tell people how to operate when he couldn't operate either. So the mistake was made. It was inevitable. And, and uh, uh, poor Chris really became physically ill from that. I mean, he, was, he felt terribly responsible for, for that. And that's how I came in, because, because he really had to leave tomorrow. The reason is, he was really, his, his blood pressure was totally out of control. He really had, to, his doctors wouldn't let him stay. So they had to get somebody they knew quickly. Uh, and, and really, Dick Smith did that all by himself. Uh, he, he just took over. And he knew me. He'd known me from childhood. I used to play football with them in the backyard. So we really were old friends. And he asked me to come over. I had promised Gene that I would retire. I was chief of pediatrics. I had Janeway's job for 10 years. And she was playing, Gene was absolutely sick of it because I looked at one of my schedule cards that started at 6.30 in the morning and ended at 7.30 at night. And uh, she just and went on day after day and weekends. It, 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 she wanted me out, go back to the lab, go do anything, but don't do that. And uh, I promised her I would. 
So I, I'll never forget going, driving over to Dick Smith's house. He said, I want to see you now. And I, I felt that was something important. <laughs> I better get going. I have huge respect for him. And uh, over I went to Chestnut Hill, and there he was. And he told me I really had to go to work <laughs> Monday. <laughs> and, uh, uh, and that meant I had to go to see Gene and say, well, guess what? Uh, not for another five years. She was not a happy camper. But I remember what she said. Well, if Dick Smith says you have to do it, I suppose you do. That's how much respect people had for that man. The first, moving the beds was one of the first things I wanted to do. I wanted uh, to, uh, one, get rid of the beds and put them in the Brigham because we had a bridge to the Brigham. I did not want to get involved with the Beth Israel or the Mass General in terms of sharing patients because I didn't see how we'd do that. We'd had to run out in the snow and, and to see our patients and that wasn't sensible to me. So uh, I wanted to move the beds out and put them in the Brigham but I wanted supervision of those patients by nurses that I trusted. Because the key to the course is the nurses. The quality of care is all about the nurses. And if you don't have nurses you feel wonderful with, then you, don't, you can't go to sleep at night. I mean, it's just that simple. And they're there on 12-hour shifts. They know what's going on. So to me, it was about protecting the nurses who were involved in, in, in the whole overdose story, um, totally without justification. This was an institutional problem. We didn't have the proper protocol controls, period. The protocols were written in the original Aramaic, and nobody was doing anything about that. That's why they got misinterpreted. It, it, you could, uh, I read one or two. I couldn't understand it either. And, you know, so to blame a nurse just because she's the tip of the spear, that doesn't, that makes no sense at all to me. So I wanted to get into a general hospital, put the beds in there, and I desperately wanted to free up space that, they were, that the beds were taking so I could enlarge the clinics, particularly the adult clinics. They were screaming for space. We, need, we needed specialty clinics. We didn't have enough of them. So those were my missions. Now, fortunately for me, Eugene Bramwell was the chief of medicine at the Brigham, and he was a very powerful figure in the Harvard Medical School. And he and I were old friends, and I, I sat down with him and he said, yes, you move your beds and we'll move he, our, whatever we're doing in hematology and oncology over to you. You do all the ambulatory and, and uh, we'll do the beds and we'll figure it out financially. Now to figure it out financially, I had to have another star and that was Dorothy Bowie, who I had tried to hire to bring her to Children's Hospital. I was just too small for her. I thought she was the cat's pajamas. Uh, in fact, on my first day on the job, she came over and <laughs> said, would you like to look at the books? Thinking I wouldn't understand the books. And of course, she was right about that. But fortunately, I guessed properly. I looked at it and said, we have a deficit. And she said, good. She said, I can work for you. You can read a book. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but she was, the, the marvelous thing about her was that not only did she understand the books, but she understood people. And she could deal with people anywhere. I had complete confidence in her. I needed a new operating officer. And that was Jim Conway. The day we moved the beds, uh, Jim, and, and the head nurse, and Jim did that together. It was a great day. It was flawless. Jim was, it was a wonderful, amusing, unflappable Hibernian with a great sense of humor. 
those beds freed up space for me to do a lot of different things, to get decent radiation therapy here. Couldn't do that, but I, mean, I needed space for, for a lot of stuff. And uh, uh, I hated the clinics. They were much too crowded. And then, of course, we, uh, the growth started to really become impossible, and I left poor Ed Benz with the, with the problem of how to, how to build a whole new ambulatory center. Ed Benz was my favorite Harvard medical student. He came to me wanting to work on the disease that I was particularly interested in, on the genetic basis of it. And he'd been told by everybody at Harvard Medical School's quadrangle, you can't do human genetics yet. It, you can only use bacteria and yeast to do these experiments because it's just too complicated. And um, he didn't believe that. He wanted to, to, to work this out. And I had already started to, to make a, have a deep relationship with MIT. And that's where I went over to, when I, when I moved the, my whole lab into the Dana-Farber, I actually took a, a second sabbatical at MIT to try to learn more about this amazing field that was happening. And I brought Ed into that, and that started Ed off, started Ed's career off. And I always kept track of him very carefully, and I was thrilled when they got him to succeed me. That was, a, that was just wonderful. The, I think probably the accomplishment that I'm proudest of is the, is the uh, Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center. Because once I got my bed problem solved and I could start to get some clinic space, I began to realize the only way we could really compete nationally and internationally was to combine all our forces. We have in Harvard everything you'd ever dream of for having a great cancer center. It's just you have to have complete collaboration. And I went to, fortunately, the, the new dean at Harvard was Joe Martin, whom I knew well, respected, and I felt that he would, he would help me to put Harvard together so that we'd have a common clinical trial program and, and would share our research ideas and really move the field together. So Joe being uh, a very intelligent and very giving person said, yeah, I'll help you do that. But then I t warned him, there's an issue. And the issue is I'll never be able to go to my trustees at Dana-Farber and tell them that I want them to give up the only cancer center grant in Boston, which was the grant to the Dana-Farber Cancer Institute given to Sidney Farber. You know, I wouldn't be able to tell the trustees we're going to take the name of Dana-Farber off of that grant. If I did that, they'd lose confidence in me. There was a question, it was simply a question of identity. They just, they're small, Harvard's very big. They couldn't be lost that way. And I told Joe, though, it's going to have to be called the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center. And he said, David, that's going to cause a lot of trouble. Not for you, but for me. <laughs> and uh, uh, I said, well, Joe, you're, you're used to trouble. You're a neurologist. So uh, he, he said he'd try. And we stuck with it. And fortunately, the National Cancer Institute felt the same way. They didn't, that was one of their first center grants. They didn't want to lose it either. So it became the Dana-Farber Harvard Cancer Center. When I think of the march of cancer therapy, I sometimes rub my eyes and say, is this possible? It was so gloomy when I started. It was so terrible. All the children died with leukemia. There were no survivors. Uh, there, 
there were no survivors of advanced Hodgkin's disease at all. If you couldn't remove it surgically and burn it with radiation, you, you were lost. That was it. There wasn't anything really to do. And that, that's what I grew up with. Uh, the last thing I wanted to be was an oncologist. It, it didn't, it, it was a terrible, only people with a, with a masochistic uh, personality disorder would want to have every one of their patients die and, uh, or tolerate that. Now, my fellows cry if they lose a patient. They're completely unaccustomed to it. It's just amazing. And I, I think that that's, a, that's just an enormous triumph of worldwide medicine. And even many of the solid tumors are starting to come under control. We're not there yet. We've got plenty of work to do, and particularly in neuro-oncology in childhood. That's, our, that's what is the major challenge in front of us now. We have to solve that. It's going to be enormously difficult. It is difficult. But we're learning from the basic scientists what drives those tumors. And we will get there. It's just going to take a long time. And we have to put our best people into it. I mean, what really happened was, because of Sidney and his stubbornness, methotrexate came on the scene. And that immediately started a flood of drugs. That's really what Sidney's enormous contribution is. He made the community realize, we can do this. We just got to do it better. The same is true of neuro-oncology. We have to learn where the target is, and then we have to learn how to crunch it. And we will do that. Okay. It's just going to be a long time. I mean, I'm 92 now. So it's been 70 years since I came to Harvard College. And uh, I think the change is just fabulous. I'm all excited. You know, Dick Smith, who was such an influence in my life, once said to me, David, I have one ambition. I want to turn this whole place into a multiplex movie theater. <laughs> And he said, I'm bringing you over here to start me on that process. And I said, well, Dick, uh, you know, that's a great ambition, but I wouldn't bring in the cameras yet. We, we, we've got a lot of work to do. I think it is an exciting prospect. I think if I w I'd love to be able to start all over again from this base. And I'm convinced it, it, the slope is not going to be as great. It's going to be more of a slog because, you know, it's normal in science that you, you grab the obvious first and go after that, and you sort of put the tough problem aside for a minute. So we, the, the individuals who are going to take the next 30 years are probably going to move a little slower, except for one thing the astounding changes in biotechnology. I, I, that's what I'm having trouble getting used to. The rate of change of, of, tech, of technique and technology is vast. It's not following that, that uh, famous curve of the uh, economists. It's accelerating. It seems that one discovery pushes another one very, very fast. So every, every time I turn around, there's some new discovery, CRISPR. Uh, you know, it, how, that, that's, a, that's a great story. Yeah, we knew about enzymes from marine life that, that, uh, that have enormous effects on, on genes. But this, is, this one was just an incredible discovery. And there'll be more. Speaking of progress, we surely hit a home run when we got Laurie Glimpshire in here after Ed Bence retired. First of all, Laurie, of course, understands immunotherapy better than anybody does. But she is also 
a determined person. I knew her, I worked with her father. I've known Laurie for years, ever since she was a fellow here. She knows how to get something done. She's determined every day to get something useful done. We're going to grow wonderfully with her.